Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening at our annual science conference, Advancing Minorities and Women in Science and Engineering. We were waiting for the other students, and high school students in particular, who were uh, having dinner uh, down at the Harvard Yard to arrive, and we're still waiting for one of our panelists uh, who may be caught in traffic, but who was here earlier today. But we're going to get started anyway uh, to bring to you this special program that is set up to deal with uh, science and encouraging students, young people of all backgrounds, but particularly minority students, minorities of color. This weekend, the conference focuses on those students and encouraging interest in science careers. We are very fortunate today to have a number of distinguished guests with us, and we're going to have each of them present to you uh, their perspective on this subject of science for the 21st century, uh, the opportunities that are available to students, and particularly to minority students, young men and women, and as director of the Harvard Foundation, and I have served in that capacity for the past 15 years, uh, I have hosted a number of different programs aimed at encouraging minority students in science, but we have formalized this now so that we'll have an annual event such as this. And I would like to, at this time, introduce our panelists, our speakers, and they are to my left, uh, Dr. Shirley Jackson. Dr. Shirley Jackson is the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and she is the first woman and the first African-American woman to be appointed to that very important position. And she has been our guest of honor, and indeed our honoree today, to receive a special award from the Harvard Foundation, from President Rudenstein, from the Dean of the College, uh, Dr. Harry Lewis, and myself, Alan Counter, director of the Harvard Foundation, and the students and faculty of the Harvard Foundation for her outstanding contributions to American science and to intercultural relations. And Dr. Jackson is joined on the panel by Dr. Kennedy Reed, and I will introduce him more formally later, and also by Dr. Gene Stanley, and also by Dr. Roscoe Giles, and by Dr. Harold Amos. Dr. Ambrose Gerald is expected momentarily. There are many things that I can say to you tonight about uh, our panels, but in particular, they are important symbols of success in science and excellent role models for us. The Honorable Dr. Shirley Jackson was sworn in on May 2nd, 1995 to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And two months later, on July 1st, she was made chairman of that organization. Prior to joining the NRC, she had extensive experience as a university professor, research scientist, and consultant, and corporate director. She's a native of Washington, D.C., where she graduated from Roosevelt High School in 1964 as class valedictorian. Matriculating at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts here, she earned a Bachelor of Science degree in physics in 1968 and later earned a PhD in the field of theoretical elementary particle physics in 1973. From 1991 to 1995, Dr. Jackson was professor of physics at Rutgers University in New Jersey, serving concurrently as a consultant in semiconductor theory at AT&T Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. For 15 years, from 1976 until 1991, Dr. Jackson conducted research in theoretical physics solid state and quantum physics, and optical physics at AT&T Bell Laboratories. Dr. Jackson is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society and is a member of a number of other professional organizations. There are many additional things that I could say about Dr. Jackson, but I think it is important to again remind you that Dr. Jackson has achieved a number of firsts in her life. She was the first African-American woman to receive a doctorate from MIT in any subject. She was the first African-American to become a commissioner on the NRC, and certainly the first woman, as I said to you earlier, an African-American woman to serve as chairman of the commission. 
Dr. Jackson is married to Dr. Morris A. Washington, also a physicist, a graduate of Fisk University, and they have a son, Alan. At this time, it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, Chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Thank you, Dr. Counter. Uh, many of you heard from me earlier today. I, in fact, told Dr. Counter I had probably said all I had to say. <laughs> but I thought I would try to give a few remarks more specifically aimed at my thoughts on careers in the 21st century in science, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And what I would like to talk about it from the point of view of is the intersection, which I think is apropos, given where we are, of science, technology, and public policy. At lunch, I spoke of the dilemma that some minority students feel they face in wondering about the relevance of their pursuit of science or careers in science to the communities that they may come from. Now, I myself am a theoretical physicist by training and spent essentially the bulk of my career doing that. At the same time, I did many other things involving science, technology, economic development, et cetera. It turns out they all track to what I do today, which is squarely at the intersection of science, technology, and public policy. I head a regulatory agency, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, as you have heard. Our mission is the protection of public health and safety in the use of nuclear energy and nuclear materials and the environment and the common defense and security in the U.S. And what that involves then is taking a staff of people, 3,000 to be exact, many of whom are scientists and engineers, but with a large complement of lawyers, fashioning a body of regulations with standards built in to protect the health and safety of the public, creating an inspection and enforcement program to ensure that those who use nuclear materials use them safely. And we have a licensing regime that's predicated on all of this. This then involves law, science, engineering, mathematics. And we have all of that represented in our staff. It is a somewhat different career than many people traditionally think of who pursue doctorates in science. But I consider that what I'm doing today to be what I call the third leg of the three-legged stool. I spent the bulk of my career in industry, in one of the best uh, industrial research laboratories in the world. I became a full professor of physics leaving there, and now I've had the opportunity to serve, serve my country by serving in the government at a very high level. And it's the kind of career that I think is exciting, and I think it's built on a couple of elements that I would just like to lay out for you, and I hope we get the chance to discuss a little bit uh, once the other panelists have had a chance to make their opening remarks. First, I think that foundation is always important, and I encourage those of you who are at the early stages of either thinking about or pursuing careers in science to do, to lay that foundation. Science and mathematics are cumulative subjects. That what you learn later, what you use later, is built on what you use and what you learned before. I believe in early success. And you say, well, how can I, as a young person, and I try to speak to young people, affect my own success. Well, you can affect your own success by setting high standards for yourself. But at the same time, as you build your academic and later professional careers, to do it in pieces that make sense so that you can be successful 
and use that as a building block. Experience is very important. You have to be willing to take advantage of experiences, particularly high-level ones, no matter where you find them, whether it be in academia, university, government, opportunities to do research, particularly at the undergraduate level. Financial support is important. Now that, in many ways, depends on your own families and institutions uh, at which you may matriculate. But in fact, the experience part of it gives you the opportunity to help yourselves. If you get various research positions, summer positions that can help you. I strongly believe in mentoring, but I also believe that the greatest mentoring is what I call modeling. Uh, many people call me a role model for many young people, but what I believe is the ultimate role model is one that shows you a path from where you are to where you want to go. And that's what I mean by modeling. And then in terms of baseline orientation and skills, I think you really have to develop today a global perspective that you can't think just in terms of a career that is meant that's st strictly structured on a mentality where you are, even just a, men a mentality involving just the U.S. First of all, science and engineering are inherently global enterprises, and where the opportunities are, are global. And there's greater and greater interconnectivity, and you have to be able to think that way. You have to be willing to move that way, to go abroad, to pursue your careers, to take assignments in various places. And finally, very importantly, you have to be good communicators. And so even as you study very technical subjects, you have to work on your communication skills, particularly your, your oral skills, your writing skills, your overall presentational skills. Because even as a scientist, while people are looking at your good work, if no one can understand what you do, it doesn't matter that you do it well, because doing it, a part of doing it well is being able to express yourselves well. I'll talk with you more later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. At this time, I would like to uh, reintroduce Dr. Kennedy Reed of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Dr. Kennedy Reed, received a B.S. degree from Monmouth College in Physics and a Ph.D. in Theoretical Physics from the University of Nebraska. He is presently a physicist at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories and will talk to you about his work. Dr. Reed. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Counter and the Harvard Foundation for inviting me to be here this evening. Uh, I attended the luncheon and had a, a very nice time uh, with Dr. Jackson and the other uh, panelists here and interacting with the students who were present also. Um, like Dr. Jackson, I've spent most of my career as a research scientist. Uh, my particular field of uh, specialty is atomic collisions. But in addition to that, I've spent a large part of my career uh, working with students, particularly students in uh, historically black colleges. Uh, I've been very fortunate, I feel, in working at a place where, in addition to my research, I have been, first of all, allowed to pursue my interest in encouraging minorities. But beyond being allowed, I have actually been encouraged to uh, expand my interest in that area. Um, so, I thought that what I'd do in my opening remarks is to uh, talk a little bit about national laboratories, uh, since Lawrence Livermore is one of the national laboratories. Actually, there are uh, 31 facilities that are operated by the U.S. Department of Energy that are called laboratories, and these are in 16 states. Of these facilities, there are eight major laboratories which are designated as multi-program laboratories. Uh, should I stop for just a minute to allow people to get seated? Or? Sure, please, come right in if you like. There are seats right up front here, so come right over.
Some of our students are coming directly from yes. the dining hall. So are you okay? There are other seats right here in front. Go ahead, please. Let me cross. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, of these eight laboratories, most of them are prob probably very well known to uh, people here, at least by name. Uh, some of these include the Los Alamos in New Mexico, uh, Oregon National Lab in Illinois, and Oak Ridge in Tennessee, and of course, Lawrence Livermore, where I work in California. Uh, one of the strongest characteristics of these multi-program laboratories is that they are driven by missions, missions connected with the national interests. For example, at our laboratory and at Los Alamos, uh, weapons and defense, uh, national defense, are a large part of our mission. But also, all of these laboratories are concerned with national energy needs, energy production, and another uh, area that is of particular interest is ecology and environmental remediation. Uh, these laboratories are very large multidisciplinary research organizations. And in these organizations, use is made of very large teams. Large teams are brought together to work on large complex problems. Uh, for example, the problem of taming fusion energy for practical purposes. Uh, these organizations are characterized by long-range efforts, which are not necessarily influenced by near-term market forces, which is in contrast to industry. Um, they are applications-oriented more than basic research-oriented, and this is in contrast to universities. And such organizations need very large operating budgets and very large staff. For example, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory has a staff of about 8,000 employees. Of these, about uh, 1,200 are PhDs, and approximately 60% of, of those PhDs are in the area of physics. Approximately one-third of them are engineers, and maybe a quarter of them are chemists. There are also about 3,500 who are at the master's and bachelor's level, and a large portion of these are engineers, and also a large portion are in uh, computer science and mathematics. Um, the missions encompass a broad range of research areas, uh, including materials research, high-performance computing, future energy production needs, geophysics, et cetera. Another function of the uh, national labs is to operate user facilities. A good example of this is the uh, advanced photon source at uh, Argonne National Laboratory. And what I mean by a user facility is that there's a large piece of apparatus uh, which in, in this case is a synchrotron source, but it is, uh, it is staffed by uh, people at the laboratory, but used by outsiders, such as university professors. There's also the National Energy Research Computer Center, which is at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and at Livermore we have the National Ignition Facility. Uh, the national laboratories are in a state of change, and that's very important in terms of uh, of uh, future directions for people who may be working in physics or other areas which might uh, provide employment as, at national laboratories. For example, uh, one of the missions now for, the, uh, for our laboratory includes uh, support for American industry and economic uh, competitiveness in the global arena, which is something that I think that Shirley referred to. With the end of the Cold War, we no longer have nuclear testing, and so we have changed our emphasis on national security and weapons research. Uh, there's very much more interest now in environmental restoration and biotechnology. There have been sizable budget cuts, which have been mandated by Congress, and all of these things are going to affect the uh, uh, future employment at national laboratories. Um, some of these effects are going to be uh, fairly apparent right away. For one thing, there's going to be fewer opportunities at national laboratories to pursue traditional areas such as atomic physics, which is my area of research, or nuclear physics, to pursue these for their own sake. There are going to be fewer positions that are what I call tenure equivalent, uh, sort of like a college professor type position. Already, most of the new hires at the national laboratories are term hires and postdoctoral um, hires. Uh, I wanted to mention, in light of these changes, what I think are some important skills uh, for people who are going to be working at national laboratories in, in the future. Uh, as Shirley mentioned, it's extremely important 
to, to develop strong technical skills. These skills are necessary and they will help to get you in, but they're not enough. It's extremely important to develop interpersonal skills, motivational skills, and these are as important as technical skills, especially once you're in. These are, these are especially important for retention and advancement. Communication skills and salesmanship. Uh, person, no matter how strong you are technically, it's uh, meaningless if you can't communicate your technical skills to others. A person has to be able to communicate and sell ideas, not just to his peers and fellow scientists, but to diverse general audiences. A person has to be able to generate confidence, that is to have people believe in what you are talking about, technically and otherwise. And I think a very important skill to develop, uh, and this has certainly been important for me, is to uh, cultivate the ability to influence without authority. That is to get people to do what you want them to do, even though you aren't their boss. Uh, it's <laughs> extremely important to uh, cultivate the ability to interact and collaborate, especially in a place such as Livermore or Argonne, where you have to work as a team. A person has to be able to give and receive uh, feedback and has to avoid what I call the isolated worker syndrome. A person has to be flexible, have the ability to adapt and grow, and expect that you will be required to perform very different tasks from year to year. The job that you do when you start out will not be the job that you have five years after you start. And I think that uh, Dr. Jackson is an excellent example of how that can work. Um, I think that I'll stop at this point and uh, let me just conclude by saying though that I think that going into the next century that the national labs are going to be uh, very important places of employment for scientists uh, because they're going to be the principal institutions for large-scale long-term research. Only the government can undertake things such as fusion energy. Environmental monitor monitoring, remediation, and national security needs are again things that only the government can, uh, can address uh, fully. The national labs are going to continue to need highly trained and creative people and they're continue to, uh, going to continue to leverage these people to produce the best programs. The national labs are high-tech facilities with rich and new, exciting technology and applications. There's a diversity of opportunities for people with broad-based interests and backgrounds. And finally, they're going to continue to seek strong leadership, including strong minority leadership in technical areas. Thank you very much, Dr. Reed. As I look out over this audience of very fine young students, and many of our teachers are here if you're in high school and college students, I think that as we go down the line of talking to you, hopefully you will begin to sort of target some of these special areas of your own interests and ask questions at the end of the, the discussion. I'll quickly add that uh, I had the privilege of visiting uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory to, d to deliver two lectures. Um, uh, Dr. Reed uh, was very much involved with that. And one of the things that impressed me most at this center for, uh, as he described, a number of different uh, scientific uh, studies and projects, but mainly known for um, its weapons work, that uh, now many of the scientists have been uh, involved in another project called, as I recall, Operation Plowshare. Uh, which comes from the, the old biblical saying of uh, beat your swords into plowshares at the end of war. And in this Operation Plowshare, I visited a number of scientists there who are working, who are previously working on atomic weapons students, but who are now converting their energies to studying things like AIDS, AIDS research, uh, how to uh, get into the virus. And as a biological scientist, I can tell you it's really great to have these physicists and others target their energies towards subjects such as this. So I was most impressed with that program. Um, I just wanted to add that. At this time, it is a pleasure to introduce to you uh, another scientist who is uh, very close to us here locally. Uh, she is Dr. Jean Stanley, who is from Wellesley College. And Dr. Stanley uh, received her BS degree from the University of London, England. And uh, she received her PhD in organic chemistry from the uh, University of Nebraska. And she's presently 
a, a, an associate professor of chemistry at Wellesley College and director of a minority mentorship in science program at Wellesley. So at this time, it's my privilege to welcome to the podium Dr. Jean Stanley. Thank you, Dr. Counter and the Foundation for having me to be one of the panelists. And I look out and see at least two old faces, um, old but new, um, <laughs> former students. Um, nice to see you. I'm going to talk to you um, particularly about chemistry and about opportunities in chemistry, and um, particularly use something, some of the things that I do to highlight some of the preparation necessary in order to um, be successful in chemistry, and to also show you how some of the skills that you learn as an undergraduate is valuable in allowing you to pursue various aspects of chemistry. Um, as a professor at a liberal arts college, our job is somewhat twofold. Uh, most of our responsibility is teaching. However, a large part is doing research. And one of the beauties in some sense of working in academia versus working in industry, they all have pros and cons. But one of the thing, aspect that I like about working in academia is that I can choose to do the type of research that I am particularly interested in. It is not driven by a profit motive or by someone from outside. And so with that, I can concentrate on the kinds of things that are considered important to me or something that I know particularly minority students are concerned about, relevance, how does what I do impact my community? And I think as both um, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Reed point out, some of the things we're always concerned about is that somehow science doesn't seem to fit into the repertoire of helping our community. Most times we think about helping our communities, we think of medicine in terms of we can see its direct application. But I want to show you how a subject such as chemistry can in fact be relevant um, to um, the community. For example, one of the particular projects that I'm interested in is looking at using nuclear magnetic resonance technology to understand some of the um, shapes of certain types of molecules called delta lactones, which are particularly important in um, drugs that are used for high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And many, as most of you know, many people in our communities um, suffer from many of these ailments. And so having an understanding of how these drugs work in the body and knowing how you can manipulate these in order to change some of the side effects and to develop new drugs is very important. And so um, with a PhD, for example, you can be in a position to be one of the people who are at the forefront doing these kinds of research to help to develop new drugs and therefore have some direct impact on one's community. The other aspect um, that I do in terms of teaching and is I know once you sometimes mention chemistry, it's always, um, <laughs> it either brings joy or fear um, <laughs> to one's heart. Um, but I think um, chemistry is um, extremely important and one of the things that I want to emphasize is the need for preparation. And early preparation is very vital. And I think again, Dr. Jackson pointed out, science and in particular chemistry is extremely cumulative. The things that you've learned in the first day of class becomes very important by the last day of class, and therefore one cannot afford to forget what was learned in the previous courses, and so one has to try to um, continue and pile these things up. The second thing I want to point out in terms of, um, in order to go into chemistry and be successful, is the need to have good study habits. One of, I think, our greatest downfall is not knowing how to study what I call effectively. Oftentimes, we spend our time studying while watching the TV or um, listening to music. <laughs> and oftentimes, that works for some of our other subjects. But for most of the sciences, it is very important that we concentrate and try to understand the concepts rather than try to memorize a particular formula or how to do a particular problem. And so that's something I think that is very important for us to learn at a very early age because that is going to enable us to do well and therefore to be able to go on. The second thing I want to point out is the interdisciplinary nature of science in general. Science provide you with what I call problem-solving skills. 
that are useful in science and also in all other aspects of your life. Having the discipline of knowing how to tackle a problem to say, what is this that is being asked of me? What information do I have? How can I apply those particular information to come up with a particular answer? And once you have an answer, does this make sense? Those are skills that you learn in science, in particular in chemistry, and these are skills, if you learn them well, is going to stand you in good stead, irrespective of whether you go into a scientific discipline or not. And so it's very important that you try to develop these skills very early. The other thing that I think um, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Reed talk about is working in teams. And working in teams is not something that only happens once you've graduated and you're in industry or in academia or in the government labs. I think particularly for African Americans, we need to start learning to work in groups in colleges and in the high school. Somehow, I think we tend to think that if we cannot do it by ourselves, it is not worth doing or somehow we're cheating by not working with others. And I think we really need to develop ways to work with others in order to solve these problems because particularly for solving scientific problems, even in the classroom, it goes much easier and you get much more out of it if you're working in a group. And so um, those are some of the things that I think are key things that are helpful not only at the undergraduate level but are things that you're going to take later on in the job market. It will prepare you for the interdisciplinary nature of science in that once you have a good understanding of a particular scientific discipline, it allows you to understand other scientific disciplines. You will not be an expert in all aspects of science, but you will be able to be comfortable in terms of understanding when someone else is talking about a particular thing. And also, secondly, I think it makes you a good citizen. And Dr. Jackson talked about the public policy and the association of public policy with science. If we understand scientific discipline, then we're able to be informed citizens and we can help to not only make some decision but to impact some of the decisions that are made, particularly about people in our communities. And so um, those are some of the things that I think I want to particularly point out. In terms of my own life, I just want to leave you with some little caveats in terms of choices. Um, I think having a PhD in chemistry when I was done allowed me certain choices. Um, I have a family, and so I had a choice as to whether I could go into industry or go into academia. And the choice that I made, I decided to go into academia because it gave me more flexibility in terms of being able to balance the needs of my family with my career. But one of the things that I really want to point out is if I wasn't in a position where I had a PhD, I would not have been able to make those kinds of choices and those kinds of decisions. So I think that's something you need to think about, that having a PhD in the sciences does allow you to make choices in terms of the kinds of career paths that you can go in. It gives you much more options and provide you for um, future um, career. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stanley. At this time, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Dr. Roscoe Giles. Dr. Giles received his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago in physics and his PhD from Stanford University in theoretical particle physics in 1975. Uh, he came to MIT where he did a postdoc and became assistant professor in the Center for Theoretical Physics. And he left MIT to go to Boston University where he began to work in computational physics and where he presently works on computer systems and designs of software. It's my privilege to introduce to you from Boston University, Dr. Roscoe Giles. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Uh, Counter, and, and again, all, I echo thanks to the Foundation for uh, giving uh, us all this opportunity to, to uh, say what we think about this issue. I think I want to take a little bit different angle than you've heard. I echo a lot of the sentiments that people have said so well so far. Uh, one thing, I, one idea I wanted to convey uh, about my experience and in science and engineering is that it's exciting and interesting and fun to go through this exercise. I mean, it's true that it's of great social benefit. Maybe you'd even make some money if you decide to talk to the venture capitalists or whatever. But what is really going on is that there's a certain part of it that really is fun, exciting, interesting, uh, if you're able to build on your experience and background in mathematics 
and the basic sciences to advance the field, to introduce new ideas and go forward okay, with the kind of technology that supports everything we're doing. In my own case, uh, I came to science and engineering uh, in the direction of physics, as, as Dr. Counter's introduction indicated, and really before that mathematics. I was trying to figure out always, should I do mathematics or physics? What so enthralled me about the mathematics in, at an early age was the idea that you could really begin to build a system of precisely describing and to some extent thereby understanding natural phenomena. So I thought that was a wonderful thing. It was true certainly in the way I used it in, in English classes and literature that the further I built out in some direction if I was describing things only in words, the fuzzier and fuzzier things got until they sort of went off into a murky mist. But that wasn't true with mathematics that I could start with a problem, I could go from one point, follow things in a progressive and logical way, and end up with something that was just as correct as each of the intermediate stages. And I thought that was wonderful, and a wonderful tool. And I, you know, it took me a long time to figure out whether I wanted to use that tool, just play with that tool for its own sake, or you know, use it in physics to somehow you know, close the loop and get back to talking about nature and all that. But it was, you know, I found that a wonderful power to be able to develop understanding in a sort of systematic way. Uh, uh, using these tools. Uh, you know, I followed that my, myself by going into elementary particle uh, theory and physics, which was a study sort of of subnuclear interactions. But this philosophical transition and in, uh, uh, ba ph philosophical basis for that, the, the idea was the idea that by understanding the smaller and smaller constituents of matter, one could begin to understand the origins of all the other phenomena that we see day to day. I mean, this is, these are the words that, that went with that. It was, it's very reductionist in sort of 19th century, actually. Okay? And it's actually not true in a certain sense. That is, by understanding the little pieces doesn't necessarily help you understand how they act in concert when you put them back together. And that's sort of the second part of what I started doing when I leapt from physics, uh, theoretical physics, to talking about computers. The way I use computers in, com in terms of computational physics is exactly to study the question using computation rather than pure mathematics of how systems made of relatively simple constituents, simple molecules and so on, uh, but in large numbers and hopefully in numbers eventually that approach realistic macroscopic scales behave so that one can actually begin to invert that path and say if we understand the pieces, how can we come back up? to macroscopic levels, and the computer is the key tool that will allow us to do that. And so that's sort of how things got connected. But at each stage of that, though it, div it required you know, the sort of sacrifice of other things to some degree and uh, you know, diligence in getting things done, it was also fun, exciting, rewarding, and interesting uh, in the process. And I think you will have that same experience in the fields that you've chosen uh, to follow. And I, and I, want you not to forget that. On the computer side, looking to the 21st century, I think it's unar in, un unarguably true that computers will be important. We sort of all know that. Uh, I wanted to sort of convey to you one more aspect of, of the excitement of science and also particularly of computation. And that is, you can tell in some fields of science and in some fields of technology when things are really happening, when you're at the key point of transition in the society. It's that way now with computers. You see it happening that as we network computer systems build a, a sort of national fabric of computation uh, and, and sort of computational infrastructure that every, the people everywhere are beginning to employ advanced computation in the sciences in the way that I've described. Uh, it's also happening in a lot of other fields of science. Genetics comes to mind. And I think uh, many people would feel that for their own field, whatever it is, that there's this level of excitement and things bubbling over. And of course, with that goes confusion that people don't, you know, that everybody doesn't know what everybody else is doing, that things that new information comes up so fast, it doesn't have time to equilibrate from the west coast to the east coast, you know, and it's, it's wonderful, but that's part of the excitement. Uh, so anyway, uh, I wanted to convey those two ideas, excitement and computers are a really good thing, and I'll <laughs> talk more about that uh, in the discussion uh, part as we need to. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Giles. I'm really so happy that you did mention that. It was something that I had hoped to say to our students because I don't want you to get the impression that science is so serious it can't be fun. It is a lot of fun, and I'm so happy that you related to that. 
And as I think of that fund, I, I'm uh, reminded of the fact that Bill Gates of Microsoft fame, you know, Bill Gates, students with a computer, his father said he used to uh, wonder why his son was in the room laughing uh, by himself. And he'd often go and open the door and his son would be there reading a physics book. And he could not figure out what was so funny about physics, but he would laugh. And as I thought of that, I also thought of the fact that uh, I have a colleague and friend uh, who uh, has a degree in mathematics. He later got a degree in MBA. He later got a law degree. He was the only person I ever knew who would read math books and laugh. And he's here tonight. He's Mr. Charles Rubin, Charles Stan. He is vice president of Roxbury Community College. And he's, a, <laughs> he's also a jazz musician, by the way, students. So it shows you, you can be pretty well balanced. So he uh, does very well. At this time, I would like to introduce to you someone who has the privilege of living in one of the most beautiful parts of the world. He uh, lives in Woods Hole, and he happens to work there. And for many of you uh, in this audience, you may not know this, Woods Hole is a center of biological research. It's a, sort of a mecca. People come from all over the world to go there to study. And he is the chief uh, of research planning for the Northeast fisheries. Uh, he is a biologist, and uh, he is a very distinguished scientist. And I'd like to introduce him, Dr. Ambrose Giral. Will you please come to the podium? Thank you, Dr. Counter. Uh, good evening. I feel now that there uh, isn't much that I can <laughs> say to you that you haven't already heard, and um, I don't know how uh, else to characterize a very important message that uh, you've received here today, beginning with Dr. Jackson's uh, presentation. Um, what I uh, would like to share with you uh, in terms of um, satisfaction advantages of a career in science uh, starts with uh, perhaps for most of us uh, we often spend our lives becoming uh, somebody or something else and that we may find along the way that we want to reclaim that life that we thought we knew one time or that was really the real us are, are. So uh, I guess what I would say to you is um, do try to be very sure that the direction that you take is the life that you want to become or will lead you to become the person that you think it is that you would want to be. Uh, I think that uh, for me to uh, try to repeat some of the things that are said here, uh, would not be beneficial, but I think what I need to say is that I'm going to assume that uh, you are already on your way. Uh, you certainly have the uh, necessary uh, background to make very informed decisions. Uh, you perhaps have to do what all of us have had to do, and that is continue to mature. And uh, unfortunately, you're living at a time, I believe, when you can't make as many mistakes as some of us that are sitting up here might have been able to make and uh, get down the road to becoming that somebody. So that's important from my point of view. Um, in terms of um, uh, the satisfaction and advantages that I have uh, uh, witness uh, as a scientist, as a uh, zoologist, as one uh, trained in uh, uh, the aquatic uh, biology, uh, beginning with fresh water uh, in uh, Oklahoma, and one would wonder why would one go to Oklahoma to study mm -hmm. anything that has to do with water, <laughs> but it turned out it was a gold mine, so to say, for one interested in uh, a, a classical approach to uh, fisheries biology, because uh, you get to uh, uh, experience uh, when looking at the uh, ichthyology, uh, uh, the western cline, the eastern cline, uh, etc. Uh, so it's, it was really a delight. But uh, I've moved a long ways from there uh, in terms of what I'm doing now as chief of research planning and coordination at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, um, and. 
along that way, I would say the satisfaction advantages that I've had certainly have been, had to do with the people that I've met along the way that have been very important in my life uh, for me to have accomplished uh, what I have thus far. Uh, the uh, places that I've had the opportunity to explore by being one interested in uh, the natural history, interested in the outdoors, interested in the environment, uh, have just been, uh, uh, you know, wonderful. I just returned from a close to a five-week uh, uh, stay in South Africa, which was uh, a marvelous experience. Uh, and I did get to meet with young people there. Uh, I visited uh, uh, several of the colleges and universities, uh, both the uh, historically uh, disadvantaged uh, universities and the historically uh, advantaged universities. And that is an interesting area right now during this um, transformation. Uh, there has been the discovery of myself and nature that has been an advantage uh, with a uh, science background. And then there has been, uh, from the way I see it, uh, trying to capture uh, what it is that uh, uh, keeps me going or that really gets my attention. And I think it's just the um, scientific approach or the way uh, that one approaches knowing the epistemology uh, uh, characteristic of science that really appeals to me. So from my point of view, this has been both satisfying and it's been an advantage. And um, I think I would just like to stop there and uh, and say that uh, I think that you uh, can find that self or somebody that uh, you may be looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jarrell. And last, uh, but certainly not least, is someone uh, on our panel who has probably trained more students like yourselves than all of us here combined over the years. Uh, Harvard um, has a long and very um, impressive history of distinguished professors, but Harvard has had very few minority professors of color. And one of the few who has been here for over 30 years uh, and who has done an outstanding job of bringing others to this university, particularly students, young men and women of all races, colors, and backgrounds, and trained them very well and has served as a mentor and role model for many of us who are here today, is the person I'm about to introduce to you. He uh, recently received an honorary doctorate from Harvard University as well for his many years of work. And he works closely with the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation, which provides scholarship money for students uh, to go to uh, uh, medical and other schools uh, throughout the country. I'd like to introduce to you Professor Harold Amos, Professor of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry Emeritus. It's always embarrassing to have to talk after these introductions. But uh, in fact, I elected to be last. Uh, but I should have realized that uh, these are either faculty members or former faculty members who preceded me. And no, the instructions were to talk for five minutes. It took us 45 minutes to get through the three of them. Therefore, my talk is going to be quite brief. Uh, and I thank you very much for leaving me uh, just a few minutes to do this. Uh, uh, furthermore, let me say that, uh, in a way, I'm a little bit uh, unsure. I, we're talking to the anointed here, uh, talking about science in the 21st century. You're it. And the question that we were asked in general was, you know, what do we see, foresee? Uh, what can we ask you to contribute to making the career of science not only attractive for yourselves, but also attractive for those who are to follow. What I, my interests are not primarily in minority students, they are in, it is in scientists. And science is a community which does not really know ethnicity. It may be that we impose to a certain extent ethnicity on it, but that is an imposition by human beings and nature has not recognized that. Uh, I was particularly interested that Dr. Gerald lives at Woods Hole. Uh, my uh, almost full knowledge of Woods Hole 
came from sleeping in my sleeping bags uh, <laughs> on the lawns of professors. <laughs> and in fact, uh, generally, uh, I was a graduate student at the time, so I was too dignified to sleep in my sleeping bag at later. But as a graduate <laughs> student, I slept in my sleeping bag, and the kids who were small kids, um, uh, you know, age five, six, and seven, would wake up early in the morning to look out to see if I was still there. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, sometimes they, they, they missed me because by, by five or six o'clock I'd had enough of the bumps and lumps and I would go off and have a cup of coffee or whatever at the, at the nearest possible place. But now, for looking forward to the 21st century, uh, my own view of, is that you will have unprecedented opportunities to be involved in science at the level at which you want to do it. I have had uh, the, the opportunity to wander around the country over the last 15 or so years and uh, to get some idea of what is happening in terms of programs, and I speak particularly now to minority students, and I include the Hispanic American students, the Native American students, and also African American students. There are, pro there are more programs and more opportunities than there are candidates. Our problem is that we have not been able to uh, convince the, I'll speak now just to the African American community, but I suspect that a certain amount of what I'm saying is also true of the Hispanic community in USA. I'm not talking about Puerto Rico, where things are quite different, but in USA. And that is that the African American community does not support science. In fact, science has almost no place in the African American community. We're into religion, uh, we're into entertainment, athletics, and a lot of other things, but no one sees science as a real part of life and something that is science and technology as the future, not only of the country, but also of the minorities. You cannot belong, the unique thing about the Western world is science. Philosophy, literature, music, all the others belong to everyone but the Western world is science. And I speak as an African American, we're here, we're here to stay, we're Westerners, and we shouldn't start trying to pretend that we're anything else. And our future and our right to belong to the American society also is very much related to our investment in science and in technology. It is the future of the country, and it's also your future. Now, what can we do? about the question of bringing the African-American, to what extent also Hispanic, communities into the effort, the serious effort, to make science a part of life. I'm always struck when I go to high schools, and I'll try to go as often as I can. You can be in the drama club, and they actually, you can be a cheerleader, and everybody is jumping and cheering about it. You can be uh, talking political science, uh, psychology, sociology, history, everything, except science. Science is, relegated, is, is reserved for a few students put off in a corner somewhere with an announcement, and everyone else tries to chart a course that will avoid that particular uh, room. <laughs> now, obviously, you know all this, but you've already not only survived it, you are actually making your uh, commitment to be scientists, and uh, your commitment also involves uh, other people as well. And I have one or two, uh, my, in fact, I want to make my, uh, my statement, I hope I'm not over my five no, minutes. No, no, please, sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want, I want to, my, my, my effort here is to ask a question. And the question, and I want to offer also one, one, or, two, uh, uh, one or two suggestions uh, as well about how to, what we can do to, uh, to actually begin to bring science in. First of all, I think the African-American media, I include the magazines, I include whatever there is of television and radio, needs to commit itself to the attractive aspects of science. First of all, it's a very happy life. I wouldn't have lived any other life 
You couldn't have taken me. Of course, they wouldn't have taken me in Hollywood anyhow. I don't look like a Hollywood <laughs> person, and I'm a lousy actor. And at the same time, I don't sing, and I don't dance, and I can't even shoot a basketball. <laughs> so uh, I had to be, it, it's science. But the idea that scientists live in an, an isolated life is absolute nonsense. You are closer to the person who spills the acid on your feet, or actually in uh, some other, or, uh, well, apparently you've had some experience with that sort of thing too, uh, or actually gets you, uh, especially the person who either disagrees with your ideas. You get very interested if they're serious, and you can become quite, uh, not only friends, but you can become wonderful adversaries, and it pushes both of you to do something more interesting than you would have done before. Now, uh, I'm unfortunately, I'm not a minister, and I never have much, in, well, I won't say anything more than that, but in any event. <laughs> I want to ask you then, hopefully in the discussion, how can we bring more African American, and although tomorrow there's going to be an Hispanic person, into the orbit of science? And I hope that you'll think about what the communities can do uh, in this respect. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Professor Amos. Let me just say that although the emphasis this evening is focused on an underrepresented uh, minority in science, African Americans, Dr. Amos raises a point. We're equally concerned about trying to increase the numbers of women of all races, all colors and backgrounds in science, as well as students of Asian American, uh, Latino American, Native American, and others who are interested in science. So please keep that in mind. But we're focusing on this evening an underrepresented group. Uh, you also uh, raise another point that I wanted to make. Uh, no one has mentioned economic advantage. That's something that scientists seldom talk about. Uh, obviously, scientists are paid reasonably well. They have pretty good jobs. But I'm reminded of a story that was a little surprising to many of us in this community. There was a young man that we would see in the Harvard Yard walking through, going to his classes. He was just like any of you young men, a young African-American man. He'd stop in the yard to talk with us, and we called him Buddy. His name was Buddy, in fact, Alphonse Buddy uh, Fletcher. And he went through majoring in science and engineering, and we'd stop and talk, and I'd congratulate him on his good work and his good grades in science. He stuck with it. He finished Harvard. And I hadn't seen Buddy for a while until he called me and dropped me a note. And I was pleased to receive a note from Buddy saying he was down in New York. Well, Buddy had taken his science career, majored in science and engineering at Harvard, gone to New York. The next thing I heard, Buddy was giving Harvard $7 million. He was only 30. $7 million, I said. Yes, Buddy had rewritten the uh, software for much of Wall Street, and it named a professorship here at Harvard, the Alphonse Buddy Fletcher Professorship with a gift of $7 million. So there's a reward to being in science, too, sometimes. So keep that in mind. I mean, no one has mentioned that topic. But rarely will you make uh, enough to give $7 million to a university. Anyway, I, that is a true story, and uh, we're very proud, about, proud of that. At this time, we're going to turn it over to the students. Have you come forward to ask questions, and teachers, and others who are here? So uh, I'd like to ask you to come to the various microphones on either side and just stand there, and uh, we'll answer, our panelists will answer any question you might have. So please come forward. Teachers, students, anyone with a question? We'll start right here. Now, before you get started, let me quickly, I don't want to forget this. Let me introduce uh, the, the lady who has really worked very assiduously to put this program together and very hard over a long period of time and should be recognized, and that's the staff assistant to the Harvard Foundation, Ms. Wendy Bibbins. Can we give our hand, please? Stand, Wendy. I don't want to forget that before she leaves. OK, first question. Please, just come to the mic, students. Feel free to and ask any question you like. Staff as well. Just stand in line. We'll start over here. Um, Introduce yourself. I know you're from Roxbury Community College. Uh, Ray Turner. And um, hello to the panel. I want to say hello to uh, Dr. Harold Amos. And when I was a postdoc here in 87, you made me feel at home. I was a postdoc at Harvard School of Public Health. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to say, to answer your question, and first of all, I can play basketball, I can sing, and I can dance. <laughs> and as a scientist myself, who was Tom, I am one of those who didn't pursue research on a full-time basis. I mean, I was a good researcher, and I excelled, but I chose not to do it on a full-time basis. As a matter of fact, right now, I do consult and work for the Army. But there are alternatives to doing full-time research. And I think if you look at the increased number of people who were scientists uh, involved in research who are now at academic institutions, uh, particularly two-year colleges, and there are a lot right now, I'm sure, then I think that's where you can, um, I mean, if you work with those individuals, you can 
probably mobilize more minority students into um, fields of science. As an associate dean at Roxbury Community College, I have worked on several programs um, that deal with elevating uh, minorities that might be um, underprepared. So um, I, want, I, I want your um, comment on that and whether you think that would be a good idea or a worthwhile effort. Is Thank that you. directed at Dr. Amos or all oh, the Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at uh, oh, Dr. Amos, but actually okay. anyone, everybody. Right, very good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can always expect friends to put you on the hot seat. <laughs> uh, what I would say is, first of all, I, I did not actually intend to, I, in fact, I didn't mention a full-time life of research. I don't, uh, that, that is something that really uh, one ha could make a case for and uh, quite differently. But I am personally very prejudiced toward academics. I think your generation has, uh, not, I'm going to qualify that, your generation has a responsibility to actually be visible for the students we hope really to find, to have a major expansion of the numbers. And although I think the private sector is also a very, is going to be an important part of your life and or your, of your opportunities, and you will spend some of, you will split your time later uh, between uh, the, your actual scientific study and uh, the other kinds of, uh, of uh, responsibilities that you have. But if we are to have a real explosion, it really will come only when young people can see you not just working on your own, but also as someone who is interested in their future too. So although I cannot, I, mean, I, I would not actually make any attempt to funnel anyone into a specific role, I do hope that you would think about what contributions you can make in the various opportunities and options you have. Did you want to say something, Professor Giles, yeah, about I, that? I had a, a, a quick comment. It's, it's, it's in the way, perhaps, a, a bit of speculation about part of your question uh, about the role of community colleges as an entry and sort of accelerator for bringing more people into science and engineering. And I uh, certainly, there are a lot of us who are working on uh, computers and education and so on who, for, who speculate that that will actually be a very important vehicle for increasing uh, the uh, numbers in science and engineering. And the, part of the mechanism or part of the world we're looking forward to is one where uh, information itself is much more mobile across traditional boundaries than it has been. So that imagine a world uh, in where all the best lectures in physics are on CD-ROM and are available on the web. So, so the information itself, the thing that once was, you know, sort of handcrafted in the exclusive province of uh, a few institutions is now publicly available. What's not available or what you need to augment that is the piece of education that corresponds to the mentoring, the discussion, the analysis, you know, doing problem sets, all the sort of hands-on human interaction, but the information part will be available everywhere. So, uh, you know, a uh, uh, scenario is that community colleges evolve into playing that role, that people in community colleges get the same lectures you get at Stanford and Harvard, because they're all on CD-ROM, and, you know, have an alternative avenue to accelerate to meet uh, their more privileged colleagues somewhere in the middle. So I would be optimistic, in my most optimistic phase, I would look forward to that. We still have a long way to go. That's 21st century. Hmm. Very good. Thank you. Let me just uh, add here that uh, Dr. Roscoe Giles' wife, uh, as a specialist in uh, training women in science and, in, and encouraging women to go into careers in science, she's Dr. Linda Grisham, and she'll be speaking tomorrow uh, here uh, in a workshop on successes and challenges for women in science and academics, if you want to hear it tomorrow. Now, we'll have our next question from the lady at the microphone here. I just want to offer uh, a suggestion um, to Dr. Amos's question uh, regarding how to get more minorities into science. And I think this is, this is something that we spoke at earlier at our table at uh, the lunch with Dr. Gerald. Um, I think it has to start when you're young. You, you can't just get to high school and all of a sudden have this love for science. You have to be curious about, I know personally, it was a curiosity when I was very young about, uh, well, actually, I don't remember them anymore, but I, I memorized things like, you know, the ratio of land to water and um, the distance from the sun to the planet. I was just fascinated by and curious. And I think 
the introduction to just very uh, basic things. Why is the sky blue? Clouds. Just you have to have the interest at a young age, and if you have the interest, it's it's a curiosity that can drive you to forever um, to answer the question or to con you know answer question after question after question because that's what science is in my eyes questions things we don't know. Um, but on the other, being a product of the Boston public school system, my curiosity outweighed my my skills and I think my ability because I don't think. Uh, right out of high school, I was prepared for the diligent, uh, the diligence that's needed to pursue science. Um, this learning, knowing what you need to, to study, how to study, um, time management, uh, those kinds of things you're not prepared for, not as a product of the Boston Public Schools. I'm 32 now, and I've done a lot between graduating and here, and I think I'm better prepared now Right out of school, I wasn't, but it was my fascination that kept me interested. Um, so I just, I think a combination of introducing science at a young age and then providing basic skills to individuals, all individuals, and you're going to get minorities if they're given that, they're given the skills and they have the interest. I think you're going to get, just get people who have. Well, is your question then to the panel, how do we develop that curiosity? We must have a question. Is that your question? No, no actually, I was, he, he asked us to come up with, he left us with a question. Oh, okay. All and right. I was very just good. offering my... Okay, very good. Any Thank comments to that would be wonderful. And we should. welcome that. Very fine comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next question should come from this microphone. Okay. Um, you talked a lot about preparation for young students and spe specifically minorities. Um, but what is the job market like for these minorities? You know, they're well prepared, they graduate. Are they getting jobs in this industry? Would you like to address that to Dr. Jackson, Dr. Reed, or anybody at the table? or Everybody. Okay. Whoever. Dr. Jackson, would you like to comment, <laughs> perhaps? I think there definitely are jobs available. I think uh, there are diversity of uh, activities to which one can put one's uh, skills and abilities. I think that uh, there was a certain uh, something that you could have seen run through this panel where a number of uh, the speakers, myself included, spoke of uh, being trained as physicists. But if you listen, then you see that there are a diversity of things that we're all doing. So the message and the answer to your question is, yes, there are jobs. Yes, you can do very many different things with a degree in a particular discipline. And yes, you need to be flexible and let your career evolve and follow your interests. And yes, you have to aim high and work hard. And if you do all those things, you have a wonderful life. And, and that's my answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Dr. Reed? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to make a, a little bit of a further comment on that. Um, because uh, th this is a big problem in, in physics right now that uh, uh, many people who are finishing up PhDs are, are confronted with uh, a job market that may not be what they feel they have prepared themselves for. But I think the real key is something that, that uh, Dr. Jackson just mentioned, and, and I think that I alluded to also, and that is to, to, uh, to have the flexibility to, to, to grow. Uh, that is, if you're trained as a, a nuclear physicist or as a, a particle physicist, you may not be doing particle physics uh, all of your career. Your career may start out as a postdoc uh, uh, doing particle physics, and, and maybe a few years as a researcher in particle physics, but uh, as people on this panel have, have done, uh, these things evolve into other positions. So I think the, the, the key thing is that uh, uh, you, you face an uncertain market in your particular area, maybe, but you have to be flexible enough to adapt mm -hmm. uh, to what other possibilities come up. Mm -hmm. And there are other possibilities. And let me say one other thing, uh, uh, because I, I, I often hear uh, about um, uh, the overproduction of uh, 
scientists, physicists in particular, there are too many physics and uh, physicists in certain areas. But I, I have a comment that I've made before. Uh, there has never been uh, an overproduction of minority physicists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind at, at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask you, uh, how many physicists are there in that pool as far as minorities are concerned? There well, aren't. How many, how many PhDs do you get a year in physics of all the so-called minorities? A countable uh, it, number. Uh, it, uh, there are approximately um, between six and ten, uh, so somewhere around uh, seven to eight PhDs, African-American African PhDs produced per year in this country. That's uh, uh, on the order of one and a half percent. Well, I, I, bet the not, I bet they're not five in physics. Pardon me? I don't think there are five in physics a year. Uh, approximately. Five. Yeah. 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 But, but, but now that's, that's only about uh, uh, one and a half percent of the total U.S. production of PhDs in, in, in physics. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we, we are still just enormously underrepresented in, in that uh, pool. Yeah, but don't you think we could use a few more? <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> a a well, large part of my career is well, devoted to that. Well, that's the 21st century that we're talking yes. about. We need more. Absolutely. We shouldn't be satisfied with five. <laughs> Dr. Ambrose Jarrell. I think the uh, dimension I'd like to ask, uh, add to that question, which I think is uh, a question that I have run into just about every place that I've gone. And my uh, concern uh, is that that question is often asked by individuals that have not come to bear with training, educating, supporting, mentoring, and nurturing uh, minority individuals. Uh, I've, I've seen that question now uh, raised as a barrier, almost as an excuse, to redirect minority interests in science, engineering, mathematics. And so it's one that troubles me. Uh, because uh, I have to happen to believe we do not have uh, too many uh, minority uh, scientists, engineers, mathematicians. Uh, and I tend to think that um, things are cyclic. And while uh, there does not appear in some areas to uh, be many jobs on the horizon according to some uh, view of what a job is, uh, that wait 10 years or so and maybe they will be there. But if you haven't had the preparation, then when they are there, you do not, you're not in a position to take advantage. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Excellent. I'd just like to quickly add before we go to the next question that our former president, Derek Bach, who was a lawyer himself, once made the comment that he thought that we had enough lawyers and we needed to get people trained in other areas, mentioning science as well. And I'm reminded as I stand here tonight that in this very audience, we have a young man who uh, trained at Harvard Law School, finished, and then decided to come back and get a PhD in Earth and Planetary Science and Oceanography. He's Mr. Nicky Sheets. Nicky, stand, please. He's, stand up. <laughs> so I want you to know him. <laughs> we saved you. <laughs> Next question, please. Dr. Counter? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Actually, you had a comment. Forgive me. Go ahead. No, the only comment I was going to make is that, that many times when people ask that question, perhaps there's too narrow a focus. You know, I, I like to use economists as an example. You know, most economists, including doctoral ones, are not necessarily physicists, I mean, uh, professors of, of economics. And, and Dr. Amos's comment, notwithstanding that he prefers academia, the the, the message I really want to leave to, with you is you should pursue a field because it interests you. And you should aim to be the best you can be in that field. If you do that, there will be avenues open to you. They may not be ones that you had a particular idea of, of being open to you at the time you studied, but the world evolves. And from the time that you even get a bachelor's degree to when you get a doctorate, if you choose to pursue that path, things have changed so much that you have to be dynamic and willing to change. 
Because even if you think you're going to stay in a particular field, that field changes. And therefore, if you have too limited a perspective about what it is being in a particular field means, then even if you think you're staying in that particular field, you won't be as successful as you can be. And that's what I meant partly when I talked about flexibility, that as things evolve, you have to evolve. And you can't have a, a one idea of what you can do with a degree in a particular field. It is not the end, it is a beginning. That's why graduation is called a commencement. And that's why I reject the notion of a doctorate being a terminal degree. It is not the end, it is the beginning. And that's what you have to keep in mind. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. You have a question here, please. Yes, my name is Carlos Broussard, and I'm a holder of the doctorate in the university. Uh, and my current work is in applied uh, statistics and research design. My critique to Dr. Amos is first directed at his remarks that the black community does not support science. And two, I have a question for the panel as a whole. Um, Keep your critique short because we're running out of time. Do Dr. Amos, minutes. I don't think you have read the achievement data in this country that shows that black children in the third grade do substantially better in mathematics than they do in reading. So that over time, math, the underlying sine qua non of science overall, is drummed out of the achievement stream in Africa, America. It is not that there's not an inclination there. We start out better in math and we wind up better in arts and other fields. Secondly, if we look at why people do not enter the stream of science, again, you have provided no data that shows the bad teaching in math instruction that normally occurs below the post-secondary area, where the average African-American students who are going to college right now, which is largely a public college and starting out for the plurality in a two-year college, most of them do not have two or more years of math so that we are in a compensatory syndrome by the time most African-American students wind up in higher education for the plurality around science and math in large measure because of the bad background. Secondly, you have ignored the culture of math teaching in higher education in much of these state colleges where a foreign TA is the likely instructor of an African-American and the language problem that that foreign TA in teaching mathematics compounds the instruction of the subject matter, and if you follow the research that is now going on in that subject matter, what we find out is that there's a lot of disincentives and lower expectations that uh, are imposed yes, on these African-American yeah, youths yeah. in I the know. public sector okay. as a whole what that is your creates question? a no, discouragement of science. Yeah. Can we get your question? No. We have, this no, no, is for no, questions. The point is that yeah. it is erroneous as a matter of fact to mm -hmm. postulate mm -hmm. that the African community is not supportive of science as a whole. Okay, now you made that okay. point. What is your question? Now, the second we question have two more students is that given the context of the learning of science, okay, which is largely the mediation of a hostile academic culture, mostly in the public sector, all right, for, for the plurality of African-American well, uh, kids. Okay, yeah. how, do you, how do you deal with negotiating <laughs> that so that at least the plurality of black kids have an opportunity to acquire the science? Thank yes. you. Dr. Amish, I would be very start? happy to talk with you at, uh, individually at some point. I still will not retract my statement. I still feel that one of the great problems that we have to face as a community is that we are living in a non-intellectual atmosphere. There is not in the black communities, and I, don't, I challenge you to tell me, to, to point out to me one exception in which the child goes home to an intellectual atmosphere. The majority of them do not. They don't even use the language at home. I'm not talking about what the potential of black students. I happen to feel that it's as great as anybody's. And I know there are lots of reasons why they don't come to express themselves and do it. But I still think the community has got to start to accept responsibility for what happens to these children intellectually. Will anyone else and like I won't to respond back down to that, from that on the panel? Anybody else would like to respond to his question? Dr. Well, Stanley, Dr. Giles? Well, I, I, I would throw out one other idea that really for the, for the latter part, and that is what mechanisms will happen. We're in an atmosphere now of uh, lots of scrutiny of school standards, of achievements within schools, and certainly, I'm not saying that that in itself will lead to an improvement across the board, but it's certainly something that people are looking at, I think, very closely, you know, compared to what was going on before, where each school did its own thing in isolation. Uh, without sort of scrutiny from, from elsewhere. So uh, there may be some hope in that context. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Dr. Reed? Uh, yeah, I, I 
have sort of a, a comment and a question because for, when the young lady spoke before about uh, getting started at, at, at an early age and the, the, uh, in, in, in developing curiosity in science, uh, the thing that was going through my mind uh, even before this gentleman spoke was that uh, that curiosity is there in most kids, uh, mm -hmm. but it does get uh, somehow drummed out mm -hmm. uh, by secondary school, if not before. Uh, and I, I did want to make that comment following uh, what you said. But th the question comes up uh, now to me uh, is how, how do you address that? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this, this gentleman, uh, I think, made some important points. And uh, I, I'm just curious, how, how, how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. well, well, let me ask you. I mean, I, I see here on the panel people who represent a certain time in our American history. Uh, each of us uh, probably comes from a largely segregated environment where we had uh, specific uh, black teachers, most of us at least, uh, who focused on our development and so forth. And we're being told now that in the larger integrated uh, community, that kind of special emphasis on our training is not necessarily there. Is that a part of it? I don't know. I just tossed this out. What are the elements? Dr. Giral, you want to? I think it's yes, certainly it's part of it. But I, too, think that uh, what we are dealing with is we can take these simple sayings, uh, he who rocks or she who rocks the cradle spoils the child. And, and it's obviously there's a disconnect in what's happening with the minority child in the educational system. And having two children uh, go through the education system on Cape Cod in a small town there, um, I've come to see things uh, that may be just unique to that setting, but I don't think so. And I think that we are still uh, wrestling with how do we get our children through the algebra block. As you say, they start out very swift in mathematics, keen interest and curiosity about science. But uh, when they get to the seventh grade, there is the algebra block that starts. And then in high school, if they get past there, it's the chemistry block. Uh, and what I've looked at in my little town is that there are only so many seats in the college preparatory track. And so you have su significant numbers of individuals in town who are the townies or who run the towns. And so they make sure that those seats are available for their boys and girls. And so in order for that to happen, somebody has to be selected or against or screened out. Now, this is what I see, and maybe uh, it's through uh, murky glasses, but uh, I don't think I'm far off the mark. And so it's, these are barriers and dilemmas we have to deal with still in America. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get to the last two questions, but, okay, we'll go right ahead, Dr. 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 Amos. We'll get to the last two questions, but go right I ahead. I don't, I think, you know, we've done too much of this talking about uh, our not having the, this and that available. I mean, there are some very interesting programs that you ought to know about, and they're taking place, part, place all over the country. These are, one is, I don't want to, uh, to, to present a particular program, but the Macy Foundations, uh, what is now called Ventures in Education, which was the Macy High School program, I don't know whether any of you in here were in part of that, but that's a program that now has 70,000 minority high school and a few junior high school people all over the country. I don't think that's the root of our problem. I think we've fallen back. We've, we've always been too much finding excuses for not doing things. I, I just doubt if that's the real problem of USA and of getting talented students. There are a lot of talented students of getting them into science, we have to really encourage them to do it in the communities themselves. Thank you. Dr. Jackson, you want to say something? Well, in, in some ways, uh, what I have to say to the, the young man that, who, who made the comments and, and raised the question, actually, to me, is in between, or it ties together what both you and Dr. Amos had to say. It is, it's clearly hard to make up for what one might call relentless disincentive that some uh, minority students face. But having said that, and being realistic about where there may be disincentive and that it is very real, 
that in the end it does come around to the fact that we have to save ourselves and we have to save our own young people. I think there needs to be a refocus on certain community institutions of whatever types and not have battles about what those types may be. It could be churches, it could be some community-based grouping. But the issue has to do with saving ourselves. A second piece has, has to do with really thinking in terms of being a community and dropping what I call the singleton syndrome. You know, there was a, and, and attacking what I call the barriers at their roots. An example being the SATs. Now many Harvard students, African American, Hispanic who get to Harvard, apparently they've had certain uh, abilities or you know, certain things have happened to allow them to attack it that as a barrier at its root. But what am I trying to get at? I'm saying to you that there was an experiment done at UCAL Berkeley where African American students who had gotten into Berkeley were not doing as well as uh, their Asian and, and uh, white counterparts. And when a study was done of how they actually worked, they tended to go and they worked just as hard. They would go to the library, but they would work by themselves. So this particular professor decided to make the students work together and to have them work on the hardest problems that he thought they could do. I think you know what the end of the story is, and that is that in the end, these students who started out being thought of in a remedial sense ended up, ended up doing just as well and in many instances better than a number of the other students. And so I think there's certain lessons in this and I too, you know, have been as angry as you have, but then I too have oscillated to where Dr. Amos is in terms of, uh, well, it doesn't seem to be this focus on uh, intellectual pursuits or respect for it in the black community. I don't believe it's a lack of respect. I believe it's a lack of exposure and not having enough success modeling. But in the end, the ultimate way around it, yes, there, can, there will be help and yes, leadership has to be there. But in the end, the communities, we have to save ourselves. I honestly believe that. Very good. I'd like to take, we have just a few minutes left, but I do want to entertain your question, so I'll start with the young lady right here. We'll maybe get one response, and okay. then one response to your question, please. Good evening, my name is Nicole Phillips, and I'm a former student of Professor Jean Stanley. As well, I'm a second year student here at Harvard Divinity, at Harvard Divinity School. Um, I wanted to know, what can you, and since it's only one person responding, what can you tell African American students who attend predominantly white institutions about tapping into the resources either within their institution or outside of their institutions in terms of science programs or um, mentoring or um, getting into groups or so on and so forth. What, what knowledge can you give to the students who, t who attend predominantly white institutions? And I focus sp specifically on predominantly white institutions because um, I attended a predominantly white institution and if it wasn't for a professor, Gene Stanley, or um, another black professor who was a physicist, I wouldn't have found out about pre-med programs during the summer and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet um, students who attended predominantly black institutions and had the resources like maybe a Professor Shirley Jackson or a Professor Amos or a Professor Giles, so I wanted to know that. And my other question is, um, what, what do you tell graduate students who've, who have made it to um, graduate school institutions about dealing with a corporate culture that says, that, that has been saying and says to them at that moment that they may not make it. And um, my background is that I have a friend who right now is um, the only black, the only female, and the only African American in a physics program at NJIT um, and Rutgers University. And um, I know that she dealt with a lot of that stuff and I, I didn't know what to tell her in terms of that. I'm going to ask Dr. Stanley, if you don't mind, to respond to that, and very quickly, too, if you can, very succinctly, but I know it's a long and difficult question. <laughs> uh, twofold, I think African-American students have to use the resources that are available at the institution, 
we tend not to use them because most of us are coming in as first generation college students where we think that if we go for help to the various help room or tutorial session, that somehow we don't belong at these particular institutions. So we shy away from going to seek help. And I have to say, you have to be brave and go for help. Go talk to your professors because your professor have to know you for them to be able to write you recommendations forever. Sometimes you're in a class and you're doing well and then you need to get a recommendation for something and suddenly you go to the professor and the professor says, well, oh yes, you got a B plus, but what else can I say about you? And we tend to shy away from going in and talking to the professors. And again, I have to say the onus have to be on the students. And I'm sorry to say this, but we're in a culture where sometimes um, there are hostile professors. Sometimes it, they appear hostile, they're not necessarily hostile, but we have to take responsibility for our own learning. And I'm sorry to have to put the emphasis back on us, but we have to do it. The institutions are there, they have the resources, we have to force ourselves to use them. Those of us who have gone through and know about these resources have to make it our business to tell others as they come in about them. Um, because the other students know about the network. And so we have to start taking responsibilities for ourselves. Each person has to bring someone else up. Well, remember I made the comment that you have to drop the singleton syndrome. Even if you are the singleton, you can't sit around and stew in your own juices. You really have to try to find out. There are, you know, universities, it may not be just your own university. If you're in the Boston area, you know, there are any number of, of universities. Maybe not everybody is a Harvard student, but they, you know, other people study and have brains too. And maybe there aren't other, uh, you know, NJIT in, in students, but there are a whole lot of universities in New Jersey. And, and so I'm saying that, that, that those of us who are in leadership positions have a responsibility to lead, to show a way, to help create opportunity. Mm -hmm. But those who are trying to get to certain places also have a responsibility not to sit and stew in your own juices. And I think that that is, is both a, a message that Dr. Stanley essentially is telling you that you have to engage the institution you're in. And, and I'm also saying, because I went through, I was the only African-American female in a physics program, but I've been doing that my whole life. Mm -hmm. But one has to try to reach out for resources beyond yourself, whether it's other people in other physics programs, whether it's just another community, a larger community of students, whether there's a, it's a church community, a community group, don't stew in your own juices. Mm -hmm. Dr. Reed wanted to comment on that as yeah. well. Uh, well, well that's the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're that, <coughs> that's certainly going to continue to be the case after graduate school. I think that uh, Dr. Jackson and myself uh, both experience this on a daily basis, even now. Uh, but uh, my eyebrows sort of went up when you mentioned NJIT. Uh, were you, were you, I thought you said a physics student at NJIT. Yeah, because because it, the, the chairman of the physics department at NJIT is, yeah. is an African-American mm -hmm. male. And not only that, I think that uh, Dr. Jackson and I both know uh, uh, Dr. Earl Shaw, who is... Uh, He's the, the chairman of the physics department at Rutgers Newark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> got it, I got it. <laughs> <Let's talk about laughs> it. Go Dr. Amos, you want to say something on that? Uh, well, I, I don't know why. I mean, what is so different about being an Afro-American if you're a bright student interested in science? <clears throat> What's wrong with the other people? If you actually start out to find friends and to make friends, you'll find them among all the races and all the groups. I mean, this business of being so timid about finding our way as lone persons, so lone. I mean, I think that we have to stop thinking that you have to be an African American to understand anybody else, and somebody has to be African American to understand you. That certainly hasn't been my experience. Yeah, I, I think, have made, I, I think. and I've been actually supported by and strongly actually um, given the kinds of uh, support from people who were from all the areas. And I think you have to depend on yourself as a person. You're as an interesting person, and most interesting people are looking for other interesting people. And for your, uh, for your friend who is in um, uh, Rutgers, uh, there's a guy named Stephen Alexander at Brown, and he's known to, uh, are the students from uh, Haverford here? Yes. 
uh, high school students. Oh, yes, that's one of them. Uh, they, they already know this uh, lone African-American student in theoretical physics at Brown who's just passed his uh, qualifying exams. And uh, I, think, I think they would enjoy meeting each other. I'll get together with you afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Now we'll have a question from this young lady here. Um, Dr. Gerald addressed the fact of the importance of being sure of what field you're going into. And I was thinking, if um, Dr. Giles, if you could address um, some important identifying qualities that an engineer might want to look within themselves to see if they have. Because I'm a liberal arts student. I'm a freshman at Haverford College. And I'm just going through so many courses and going through so many things. I'm so confused on what I'm going to major in and what's my direction in life. And I was just wondering if you can just, and I have an interest in engineering. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking if you could just um, point out some identifying, like some basic identifying qualities of an engineer. Uh, well, let's see, at the level that you're, that you're talking, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to make such a broad characterization between science and engineering. The rough characterization is that in engineering, we are, are tending to be a little bit more applied and interested in doing the technological development, perhaps, than in science. But as soon as I say that, I, mean, I have to say I'm, in the, I'm a professor of engineering, but I, my background is all in theoretical particle physics, which none of them would recognize as engineering. <laughs> and, and so the, the lines are, are sort of very blurry. From the point of view of what you're interested in, it, it, you know, it has to be uh, a bit of, of how you feel about the subjects and how you feel about the experience of, of working in that area. It's important to acknowledge that your experience in class is not the whole experience. And so one thing I would urge on you is to look for summer experiences that let you explore more deeply one field or another. So if you think you're interested in engineering, try to do a summer internship in an engineering company or something like that that really lets you explore the whole because it, you know if you look academic, ac academically in the first two years it's very hard to tell the difference between an engineer, a physicist, uh, a chemist and so on in terms of the courses. You have to take you know, calculus and, and elementary physics and elementary chemistry and, and all that sort of thing. So from the first courses you're not going to be able to disambiguate mm -hmm. uh, you know, just on courses what's, what's going on. But I would look outside. I would talk also to professionals or in that area. If you have a chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers at your school, you should, or anywhere nearby, you should hook up with them mm -hmm. because they will introduce you to lots of uh, sort of engineering oriented experiences and lots of people to talk to. Very good. Okay, we have a group coming here at 8 o'clock. That was our last question, but because you stood, I'm going to ask you to please, if you could just be brief, we'll have the panel respond. I'm Professor Julia Thompson from the University of Pittsburgh. I thank you for coming. I really just wanted to thank the panel for making the responses to the previous question that I was, would have made. Oh, you did? Okay, very good. Well, thank you for joining us. Now, can I, can I give an addendum? Yes, oh, please, Dr. Jackson. Th there's a national conference of black physics students that's held every year. And to the uh, young person who raised the issue about the uh, young woman who was feeling isolated, it's for, aimed at undergraduates and graduates. It has an attendance on the order of 150 to 250 students. And it's organized, it was originated by Dr. Cynthia McIntyre, who is an assistant professor of physics at George Mason University in Virginia. And I'm sure she would be happy to hear from any and all of you who may be interested in that conference. Wonderful. Well, I certainly would like to thank all of the uh, high school students and all of the college students who are here tonight for joining us. And I must say in closing, we've raised some very interesting questions, some interesting issues. Hopefully you'll be around tomorrow because we've arranged for uh, very informal one-on-one -on -one discussions with our top professors at Harvard. And we have put together tonight, we have assembled a group of the finest scientists in America. I wish there were hundreds of additional students here tonight of all backgrounds. Last year we had Mr. Jaime Escalante, who was the feature of the film Stand and Deliver as our guest of honor, uh, just as Dr. Shirley Jackson is this year. We are always trying to get more students to come out to uh, show an interest in science or to develop an interest in science. And I've had a curious kind of, uh, over the 15 years of directing the foundation, uh, observation to make. We put together such a, uh, an illustrious and distinguished body of scientists. We draw a small number of people from high schools and colleges, and we're so proud to have you here. 
if we bring Snoop Doggy Dog, we fill the room on the other side. And I've always wondered, you know, what is it that makes this uh, such a difficult kind of thing? And one day this kind of, I came to some level of closure on this. I happened to be visiting a friend, and while I was there, I was putting together a chemistry set for a group of young people, uh, two, two or three young people. And as I was developing the set, I noticed that there were a couple of kids just literally crawling all over trying to learn what we were doing. And those little kids, about one about four, and I think the other one about six, were sitting there in intense observation of my assembling this little chemistry set uh, for the other children. And finally, a very large man walked in behind me and stood there. I remember he had on a vest, big arms standing there, and he was looking. And he just watched this for a solid hour without saying anything. And finally, he said, you know, I've never seen my kids so absorbed or immersed in anything. And they watch you put this science kit together. They've even participated. He said, doctor, do you think my kids could develop an interest in science too? And I turned and said, of course they can. You can see they're interested. They're about four and six, and they're showing intense observations. I said, what is your name? He said, well, my name is LL Cool J, and I would really like to help you work with kids in science. And so it just shows you that we will bring LL Cool J here next year. We'll fill this room, <laughs> and we'll bring the same scientists back and give them twice the audience, okay? So I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to thank you for coming. And on that note, I'd like to say thanks to all of the panelists, especially Dr. Shirley Jackson, our guest of honor today, uh, who came from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Please join us tomorrow at the Science Center all day. We'll have a number of faculty for you to meet. We'll have lunches, we'll have student presentations, <laughs> and you'll learn a lot. Please. The, uh, the students uh, met at Bristol MIT this year? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Well, I wish that, that I did. No, we, no, no, no. We don't, allow, we don't allow preaching. We, we make it, yeah. Critique is critique. Yeah. An academic critique is bona fide, not unless you're running a close Well, why don't you stay here and do that? No, then. no, I'm not going to do that. Because I